live in Northwest Iowa near Galva. Um, I'm about 50 miles east of Sioux City on Highway 20. And we grow corn, soybeans, small grains, uh, oats and rye for grain and straw. And I've been using cover crops for quite a while. Um, pull this up here. Okay, everybody see that? Yep, you're all good. All right. So I'm Sam, I farm with my dad and my brother, and um, we've been no-till and strip-till since about 1990. Um, I'm 31 years old, so that hasn't been all me. Definitely been raised a no-tiller. Um, we no-till soybeans into all sorts of cover crops, and we strip-till all of our corn acres. Um, we farm about 2,000 acres. I control about a third of that. Um, for the most part, we're a conventional corn and soybean farm, but uh, we are doing some transi transition to organic ground also. Um, and like I said, we've been using cover crops for quite a while. Um, that red star there is where I live. So we're right on the edge of some of that really good Dutch ground in Northwest Iowa. Um, we farm in a pretty competitive cash rent environment, some really good ground. Um, but just to kind of combat that question or that reply that work on my farm, well, this is where we're at and just you think about that. Um, so um, I've been doing cover crop research for a few years now, starting several years ago, we had fields that had wheat pressure. We use similar herbicide programs on all of our fields and we used cover crops on some of our fields. Um, we were kind of trialing cover crops to see what it would do for water infiltration, for soil health, trying to measure that and um, some of those are kind of hard to measure but right away we saw that the fields that had a cover crop on them were cleaner. They had less weeds in the spring when they were treated identical to the field next to it as far as herbicides go. So um, me being the tight farmer that I am, I figured, well, if that rye is, that was a cereal rye cover crop. And I figured if the rye is doing some work, how can we capture that and, and utilize that weed control, weed suppression that that rye is providing and reduce our herbicide program because of it. Um, we figured, there was some talk about allelopathy of rye and the mulching effect of rye. And there was some people trying um, no-till organic by rolling rye. And we just decided we were gonna try some things with that. That's when I got involved with PFI Cooperators program and set up some trials. And this is what I'm gonna show you is just the results of those trials. Um, this first one is from 2018. And then I did two trials in 2019 pretty much all centering around how we can capture the benefits of a cereal rye cover crop before soybeans. Um, and I'm not a statistician. I'm not any really good at stats at all. I probably failed statistics in high school, uh, but I've got land and some interest in seeing what cover crops can do. So I'll talk about some results here. And I think Gene is gonna pick that apart and show if maybe the science behind it is what's causing this or did I just get lucky or or how some of these are work some of these are working and, and we'll definitely show or see that in the pictures I'm going to show you. So my ultimate goal was can I offset some of the cost of establishing a cover crop by reducing my herbicide use. So in the pictures I'm going to show you on this trial it was actually the first year that this farm had a cover crop at all. And it was a farm that had some decent weed pressure. It's been no-tilled for a long time. So mare's tail and water hemp and giant ragweed were problems. And this farm had just been corn and soy in rotation. And on some of our other farms, we're doing a, a multi or extended rotation too with small grains. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so for this trial, we put on 75 pounds of Elbon cereal rye in September with a high boy haggy. Um, Elbon rye is a pretty small seeded rye also. It's about 20,000 seeds per pound. So that's a pretty good rate of that, but 
considering some of the people that are doing no-till organic or trying that are using like three or four bushels of rye. Um, that was the rate we picked. Um, we terminated that right at planting in May. Uh, they're 15 inch beans, about 140,000 population. Uh, there's just a picture of putting on the rye with the, with the hay. Um, there's another picture. Uh, this is how we set up that trial. So PFI cooperation program is really strong on random replicated trials. Um, so there's four reps of four treatments and these were half mile long rows. Every one of those, every one of these colors was a half mile long row. So this is almost a 40 acre trial. So it's definitely a larger scale thing than a, than a small plot at a university or something like that. Um, so our, what we trialed was a full herbicide program, what we'd normally use on all of our acres with a cover crop and without a cover crop. And then where we had cover crop, I did a reduced cost program and then a no residual program. So that was, and we'll get into the herbicides used, but it was 2,4-D early and then just round up glyphosate after that. Um, so we measured the cover crop biomass when I sprayed the rye um, and just killed it with life to say uh, it was about 3,800 pounds an acre. So that was roughly knee high rye at a pretty good, a pretty good stand though. Um, and then in 2018, I don't know about in the, well in Iowa anyway, I saw some attendees from the far east and the Northeast, I don't know what your weather was like last spring, but it was pretty wild here. Um, when I was thinking about putting beans in the planter to go plant beans, and we plant a lot of beans before corn, uh, we had a snowstorm. So then I ended up planting a fair amount of my corn right after a snowstorm. You can see the um, storm track here from the 13th to the 15th of April. So a lot of times we like to be planting corn by then. Um, so we were pretty much planting while there was still snow in the ditches. Um, we'll get into a bunch of this, but as you can kind of see here, the, out of all those different trials, yield wasn't affected by either the cover crop or no cover crop or different rates of herbicide. So that's not even really a, a consideration. They were, um, there was no statistical difference between the yields there. Um, this is just the listing of the herbicides that I used. This was a pretty full program, so about $35 an acre plus application costs for three trips, a pre-plant, a pre-emerge, and a post-emerge trip. Um, several modes of action there. Um, program. This one without cover, without cover crops. This one is with cover crops. And so this one is obviously with the addition of cover crops, the cost there. So the cost of the cover crop is about $30 an acre. Um, this one was the low cost program, reduced the cost of the herbicide by about 10 or $11 over the full program. And then this was that no residual program. So less than half of the cost of that full program. Um, Ultimately, the, the ROI on all of this, um, with no, no residual herbicides, so the cheapest program, um, and considering yields were close to equal, I got that cost of my cover crop down to like eight or nine dollars an acre because I had good weed control across all of them. Um, and here's just a bunch of pictures of how the whole year went. Um, so seeded in September, here's what it looks like in October, cover on the left, no cover on the right. Obviously in the standing corn that you can see is starting to des desiccate there. Um, I had a pretty good stand of rye. What's interesting here in no-till from two years ago, and the earthworms actually pull a lot of the rye seed down into their little middens, and that's where a lot of it germinated. So it's pretty clumpy, but, um, Again, 20 some years of no-till, there's really not a lot of residue left in there, in between the rows. 
Um, here's a harvest, kind of looks like a green carpet underneath. I was really happy with that stand of rye again. Uh, then in the springtime, this is obviously after the snow melted, but just starting to green up there. Uh, one thing to notice on this trial, this is actually the same field, but not part of the trial. Um, on the left there, I harvested the corn later than on the right. So the sunlight was able to get down into the rows or get down to that rye and it took off a lot better in the fall. So it increased biomass there because I harvested the corn earlier. This was an early season corn. This was a late season corn, but uh, just something to think about when you're scouting in the spring. If you think you have adequate biomass, maybe that's why. Uh, and this is definitely something we need to scout for in the spring to see if we have enough biomass to, to be able to reduce our herbicides. Um, we talk about a lot of times rye has as much biomass underground as above ground. Well, there's a picture of maybe six inch tall rye with how much root mass is under there. So even though I'm looking for above ground biomass to complete, compete with weeds, just the underground competition of this amount of root mass underneath can just take up soil space that lets or doesn't let weed roots grow very well. Uh, there's my favorite way to plant no-till into rye that's, we planted into a lot bigger rye than that, but like I said, this is maybe knee-high rye. Um, we planted in the rye where it's well above the planter boxes, but it works in incredibly well, in my opinion. Um, just, we don't have anything really special on our planter. We raised our row cleaners, but other than that, we just don't have a whole lot of problems. Uh, that is planting the trial, so I'd left some strips that didn't have cover. Um, so that's just kind of what it looks like there. Bare dirt on the right versus a good cover on the left. Well, on both sides there. But um, So this was shortly after I sprayed the rye. You can tell I'd sprayed the end rows just a little bit before that. And So there, look what the bean what the beans look like after they started coming up through completely dead rye. Um, pretty hard to see the beans coming up from the row, from the road, and hard to row those beans from the road. But you can tell we do a pretty good job of putting 15 inch rows of beans between 30 inch rows of corn with GPS, and that really helps get the beans in the ground with the planter, and that's kind of a key to planting green is you need to get your seed deep enough in the ground, um, either with more weight on the planter or however you need to set up your planter to get the beans in the ground. So there's what the beans look like in June. I didn't roll this rye or anything, I just sprayed it. So you can tell uh, these, these strips were 60 feet wide too, these trial strips. So you can tell on this side, it was a different herbicide program than on this side. And for whatever reason, the rye really laid down on this side and stayed standing over here. But ultimately that didn't affect yield at all. So end of July, this was when I was gonna spray fungicide on beans. You can tell how much physical mulch is under those beans just on the edge here. But pretty good looking beans, not much for weed pressure there. Again, looking out across, don't see much for weeds there. Across those strips that had no residual herbicide. Again, pretty darn clean beans, considering there's some strips there that just had a shot of 2,4-D early and a shot of glyphosate to kill the rye. And then what really matters is at harvest. If this was right before harvest, and I don't see any water hump poking up through any of these strips. There's, uh, the first treatment was full herbicide with cover. Second treatment was full herbicide program without covers. Again, just looking out across those strips, there's not much for weeds there at all. So what did we learn from that? Weed control is just about perfect across all the reps and treatments. So, if I got equal 
weed control equal yields and spent less on herbicide, obviously I can apply that savings to the cost of the cover crop. Um, some questions when I've spoke about this before was if I can reduce the number of sprayer passes. I think I could for the kind of consistency of data on this trial. I wanted to run over as many beans on each strip as I could. So even if I wasn't going to spray anything, I would probably still drive over those passes just to be so we couldn't say that yield was affected by wheel tracks or something like that from the sprayer. So, and at the end of the day, yields on these were comparable to all the other farms around without cover crops. So my thoughts with that was I had good biomass early. I didn't have huge biomass. Some people talk about needing five or six or 7,000 pounds of dry biomass in the spring, but I got by with 3,800 pounds. So maybe we aren't thinking totally correctly that it's just a, all about a number, but maybe about timing of that biomass that I had good biomass early versus, you know, if I would have let this rye grow until July, I would have had great biomass. But at the end of the day, I don't want to sacrifice my planting date and I don't want to sacrifice any yield. So, I'm going to plant in between late April and mid May. That's to get the best yields in our area. And um, yeah, so I guess with this whole system, we just need to manage the cover crops for a goal. And my goal now with cover crops is for weed control. So we kind of looked at this as a whole, whole system approach. You know, do I want early biomass? Does that mean harvesting corn earlier? Does that mean planting upright corn varieties that have an upright leaf architecture to let more light in to that standing corn earlier? Um, obviously the finer details of planter setup and all that, that I need a good stand of beans, regardless of what kind of cover crop is out there. Um, so there's a lot of things to think about there, but conclusion of 2018 trials, I mean, I got away with murder. I did, I did everything that I wanted out of that trial it made everything just work perfectly so I wish I, I wish I could say that for every year so we'll get into some 2019 stuff where things didn't work as well but obviously 2018 showed some of the potential of this whole system um, well there's a few things about that whole system approach um, a lot of people get hung up on uh, rate of rye and a, a rate or a date and my big thing is get enough, get enough to make you happy and especially if you can time that right before you get some moisture some rain you'll be in good shape um, so we've we've had decent weed control with everything between 45 pounds of rye and we've done some uh, we've drilled some rye at like 150 pounds and we had weed control from that too. So you can get, get away with some stuff uh, without having to go crazy, without having to drill everything. Almost all of our acres are aerial seat, aerially seeded because that's when we can get it done. That's how we can get it done. We don't have to pull a guy out of a grain cart or a combine to go drill rye. It, it's done in September and write the check and go on. So, um, Let's see, my chat box disappeared here, so I'm going to try to pull up my, the rest of my presentation here. And anyone that has any questions, we can take a question or two before we turn things over to Gina. So to access your chat box, and Sam, yours might be opposite because you're sharing, so your toolbar is at the top. And then you might have to click more at the far right hand side. And then there's a little drop down where it okay. says that. I, Did you find I see it? it now. No questions so far. No. I, I've got a few more slides here and then we'll turn it over to Gina. Okay. Um, on a second PowerPoint here, let me pull that up. Okay, I've got it pulled up on my end. I need to share the screen here.
technical difficulties <laughs> well if anyone does have a question now's a good time to throw that in the chat box are you doing trials again this year this coming season Sam? so yeah we're gonna do some on these trials. obviously more site years of similar trials what we found out, and I'll get to that in 20, 2019 trials, though, that once I've done these treatments on a set of strips, it's awfully hard to do research on that set of strips again because there's some things that might happen based on how I manage those strips. Sure. Um, we'll get into that just a little bit. I'm really going to pay attention to what my corn yields are on some of these strips in, in this following year. Okay, well, that's the right, that's the right PowerPoint. Now I just need to find the uh, slideshow part. Here we go. There we go. Can you see that? Yep, we're good. Okay, so 2019 trials. I did two trials. One was comparing termination dates in, in uh, the rye uh, with soybeans planted underneath. So uh, right at planting termination date, and then so what we thought about from 2018 that maybe we would have consistent weed control every year with enough biomass. And part of that maybe was to let the rye grow for a while after planting the beans. Um, so again, my goals with this were don't sacrifice yield, don't sacrifice planting date. And I know for the people kind of watching no-till organic type stuff, they're probably giving up some yield and they're probably giving up planting date to get enough biomass. Well, when I have rent to pay and bills to pay, I'm not going to sacrifice that when the other option is just spend the money on herbicide. Uh, we can get into soil health issues and everything else that we're getting these other benefits from a cover crop for free, but this is pretty, this is kind of the low hanging fruit to see how we can make cover crops pay is if we can capture some weed control, weed suppression out of it. So this first trial was the delayed termination trial. You can tell this was drilled. Um, so we drilled rye um, October 20th and three guys across the state did the same trial and we narrowed it down to a uh, seeding rate that was equal across all different varieties of rye um, and we decided on a million pure live seeds of rye uh, so for my Elbon rye uh, that was 52 pounds uh, we no tilted into corn stalks with a cheap uh, double disc drill and um, again planted beans mid-May and I no tilled this into the into the rye again um, standard herbicide program. So we shot for terminating at planting, which is the RMA crop insurance guideline or in a no-till system seven days after planting in our neck of the woods. And then we'd like to try something two to three weeks after planting. So let that rye grow probably about until the beans are coming up. And because of weather and whatever else, that ended up being closer to a month after planting. So again, pl planted May 11th, sprayed May 11th on the right side, sprayed close to a month later, later on the left side. So this is June 7th. That was the termination date right before I went in with the sprayer there. So <laughs> believe it or not, ask my neighbors, they asked the same question. Yes, there's beans under there. Um, the big thing was biomass, obviously, sprayed at planting. There was, I don't remember the number, 400 and some pounds of dry biomass where I sprayed at planting and close to 6,000 pounds in some of the strips by waiting close to a month after planting. So the big question here, though, is it going to hurt my yield letting that rye grow with the beans for quite a while? 
Well, we'll find out. So again, you can tell the rye here is dead and falling over. And on this side, those rows of beans disappear into that rye somewhere. Um, strips like this in your neighborhood will get your neighbors talking for sure. Um, again, start with when some neighboring fields are still tilled in black, just about. I've got fields that look like white straw versus a normal bean field. Um, and ultimately, um, we had some weeds in those strips. Not a ton from the road, it looks a little ugly. Uh, we actually went out and did manual weed counts in these strips and there's not as many weeds there as you would really think. But the strips with weeds were, like I thought, the strips that I'd sprayed the rye really early. Um, for the sake of the trial, I didn't do a post herbicide pass at all when maybe some of that would have cleaned these strips up. But these strips that look lighter in this picture uh, were the strips that I let the rye grow really big in. And for whatever reason, that delayed the maturity of those soybeans by maybe a week. Um, it wasn't a big deal. I combined them all on the same day anyway, and they were similar moisture, but just something kind of caught my eye, looked a little bit different. Um, plant height was very similar. Um, didn't see any lankiness or legginess of those beans at all. And at, I mean, at the end of the year, the yield where I let the rye grow for a long time, not statistically, but anecdotally was better. No statistical difference between the two. Um, we didn't have the incredible bean yields this year that we did last year, but hanging right in there about 65 bushels. Um, so I achieved those goals. I had better weed control. I had equal or better yields. Um, so thought we were onto something there. Um, the amount of weeds in those strips was big and um, I don't think it's going to bother me in the future. It's not enough to contribute to the weed bank all that much. And like I said, I could have gone in and sprayed to clean some of that up if I wanted to. Um, so I also did a very similar trial to the 2018 trial. In 2019, we took out one strip because I didn't want to do any passes without a cover crop. So again, trying to reduce her herbicide by as much as possible. Um, Again, full program, close to 50 bucks an acre with application costs, about half of that with one pass of glyphosate to kill the rye and one pass of glyphosate as a rescue. This wasn't planned and we'll have some pictures of that. Um, in my intermediate cost, I did try one of the new dicamba products and my thoughts on that is it's not all that it's cracked up to be. Um, I still had weeds there. So again, Aggie High Boy Cedar, 45 pounds an acre. So I backed it off a little bit. Still had a really nice stand of rye. Uh, that's what it looked like from the planter cab. Planting the beans, same thing. But in July, I had water hemp, mare's tail, giant ragweed, volunteer corn, just about everything poking through on the strips that had no herbicide other than the glyphosate burn down. What was really interesting though, when I went to spray that, those weeds looked sick. They were leggy, they were lanky, they were yellow. And most pigweed species around us, if you went to spray that with Roundup in July, that pigweed would just laugh at you. It, I mean, it might shrivel it up, it might burn some leaves off, but you wouldn't touch it. We have bad glyphosate resistance. And in this trial, for whatever reason, almost all of those water hemps died. So just that water hemp that had competed with the rye above ground and below ground, had come up through a rye mulch, had physical shading early in its life because of that rye, it, it, was, it was sick. And 
it didn't take a lot to kill it. I, again, I think I, I sprayed a quart of Roundup, so with adjuvants. And normally Roundup wouldn't clean it up that good in July, but it did on this. So there's some things to trial, definitely for next year. Um, that's what I like the, the full mold system works pretty good for us, pretty clean beans. In these other strips, a lot of these weeds in the second or the two pass strip, those are volunteer corn plants. And I didn't use any volunteer corn killer, no clethodim, nothing like that. So most of those weeds are volunteer corn in that no pass at all about, or that only burn down pass program. The biggest weeds out there are mare's tail. And, but that one pass of Roundup in July killed a lot of the um, water hemp and pigweed species. So that was pretty interesting. And kind of anecdotally across the fence, I had a neighbor that had to co-op spray three times and do the Flexstar, Cobra, whatever expensive post spray there is. He threw the book at it and even all these strips were cleaner than his beans. So <laughs> you can you can do a lot of things and and still not have very good weed control so that brings up kind of what my conclusion with some of these is that i'm going to use cereal rye as another mode of action that it may not replace my herbicide it may not replace all of it it might replace part of it but even with the best herbicide programs you're still going to have some weeds even the best herbicide programs might have a 95 percent kill rate or something like that You've still got some weed escapes. You've always still got some water hemp coming through the beans in August. It germinates all year. So if I could get that from 95 to 99%, something like that, how much does that reduce my weed seed bank at the end of the day? Um, so I'm just going to use it like another mode of action that it might improve my herbicide program, whatever I choose that to be, but knowing that it can have pretty good weed suppression effects. I can scout for that in the spring. I can assess what it looks like, what my stand looks like. Do I have a good consistent stand? And can I reduce my herbicide program? I might have all the herbicide in the shed, but do I need to use all of them because I have a good path or I have a good um, stand of rye? And then if I do have some weeds come through that rye, Maybe those weeds aren't very healthy, have been competed with by the rye, and I might still have some tools in the toolbox to clean up that that soybean field if I need to midsummer, um, and maybe do that effectively. So again, in that trial, pretty similar yields across all the all the strips. Um, no statistical difference again between any of them, and decent weed control, but not as good as 2018. So 2018 was a pretty easy weed control year in my mind. 2018 was a nightmare and we made it through with pretty minimal costs and a cover crop. So there's kind of my find findings, results, and honestly these trials bring up more questions than they do answers. Uh, we always like to joke that we may not come up with the right answers, but at the end of the day, can we ask the right questions? So that's kind of what I'm gonna to look to the next year is my, plant my cover crops, scout for weeds, apply my basic herbicide program and treat as needed. Um, and then we can get into that another day, but I believe there's a ton of other benefits from a cover crop, whether it's a monoculture rye cover crop or a diverse cover crop mix. There's so many other benefits, especially in a no-till system. Um, and we're getting all of those for free if we can pay for that cover crop in weed control. So that's what I've got. Uh, I can turn it over to Gina and maybe she'll back up some of my ideas with some real hard university data and we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, Sam. You have great pictures. Um... Yeah. 
hear me? Yep, you're all good. Yep. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, Sam. That was that was fantastic. Um, I'll try my best to, to answer some of those questions. So um, Sam did such a good job presenting his hypotheses, um, better than I'm going to do. But my main question going into my research was how much to cover crops, control weeds, and corn and soybean systems. Um, and before I can ask that question, I had to think about what does it mean to control weeds? So there are a couple ways to quantify um, weed pressure. One is weed biomass. So you can go out and imagine chopping down all the weeds and then weighing them. And this is um, maybe one of the more time consuming measurements, but it's also the thing that most people are interested in because weed biomass is what actually affects crop yields. But you could also go out and just count the number of weeds. Um, this is a lot simpler, as Sam will probably tell you. Um, and weed density and biomass are often related, but not always. So you could have, you could imagine a situation where you have a hundred tiny little weeds, like, like these little guys. So you would have a high weed density, but low weed biomass. Or you could have just one giant weed where you have low weed density, but high weed biomass. Um, so when possible, we like to have measurements of both of these. The third one is the weed seed bank. And this one um, takes, it, it's of long-term interest, like Sam was talking about. You want to know how, if your weed seed bank is growing or if it's reducing, but it also takes a long time to change. So it requires long-term experiments, which in a lot of um, university-based research, they're only three years. So this one, um, while it's of interest, it's a lot rarer to get that kind of data. So the first thing I did um, with um, a bunch of other people, which I'll talk about later, is we looked to see what researchers have already found. So we looked for research that had been done in one of the 12 um, states shown here, and these are the top corn producing states um, in the U.S. And so we chose to, to look there. I know we have someone from Ohio, so you're, you're over here. And we found 15 studies that had looked at the effect of winter cover crops in corn soybean systems. So we were very targeted. We wanted to know how cover crops um, planted in over winter in cover crops would affect weeds, specifically in corn soybean systems. And so from these 15 studies, we extracted 123 comparisons of weed biomass in a cover crop and a no cover crop treatment. There were 119 weed density comparisons, and there were no weed seed bank comparisons. And this is probably because most of the studies, um, all but one, were only in place for two seasons. And the, the, the one study was in place four seasons. So these are all fairly short term trials that were included. And this is what we found when we combine all of this data. Um, so this is, these are the results for weed biomass. And what this figure represents is the change in weed biomass relative to the no cover treatment. So I'll kind of walk you through this. Um, we broke it up by cover crop type. So a grass cover crop showed a mean reduction um, of 68% in the weed biomass. So if you, if you used a grass cover crop, the weed biomass in that treatment was 68% less than in the no cover treatment. And I've used yellow to indicate something that was statistically significant, which means that we're, we're confident that this was an actual um, reduction. And the gray indicates um, a number where we're, it was not statistically significant, so we're not confident that there was an actual effect um, of the cover crop on the weed biomass. So you can see that the non-grass 
cover crops, which included both legumes and grass legume mixtures, didn't have a significant effect on weed biomass in all of the studies that we surveyed. The measurement timing was another thing we looked at. So if you're measuring the weeds, the weed biomass before you're planting your cash crop, you see a bigger reduction compared to after planting, but you still see a significant reduction after planting. And then the type of weed, unsurprisingly, the winter annuals were reduced the most by using cover crops, followed by summer annuals, and perennials were not significantly affected by using a cover crop in the corn soybean systems. So that's weed biomass and weed density showed no significant changes with the use of cover crops. Um, that just shows that cover crops are, may not be reducing the number of weeds, but I think like Sam has seen, it reduces um, the size of the weeds and it, the size of the weed um, affects how easily it is killed by herbicides. So a smaller weed is much easier to kill. So like Sam said, um, using the cover crop might be seen as a way of just making your, your herbicide program more effective. And I think the results from this research synthesis support that. So the title of this farminar is Cereal Rye for Weed Management, um, which I think is appropriate because we saw that the grasses were the most effective way to reduce your weeds. So we wanted to know what might be a target cover crop biomass production that you need in order to get this reduction in weed, in weed biomass. And we found that across all of these studies, you need an average of 4,500 pounds of grass cover crop biomass per acre. And with that, you get a 75% reduction in weed biomass. Um, and so Sam has a good, a good sense of how much, of what, what that looks like. But if you don't, um, pop can is approximately, if you have rye that's uh, as tall as a pop can, it's about a thousand pounds per acre. So you can imagine that you would need about four and a half soda cans tall. Um, your rye would have to be that tall in order for it to be 4,500 pounds per acre. And I'm, I, I, I tested this at home and I'm pretty tall, but it is, it is up to my knee. And Sam also, I think mentioned that it was, it was knee high when he got around 4,000 pounds per acre. I think this is a good, a good. We also wanted to know how likely it is that you'll get 4,500 pounds of cover crop biomass per acre, um, given different planting dates and different termination combinations. So we used uh, a crop model to simulate um, rye growth at three different planting dates. And we use 35 years of weather data. And so what I'm showing is what, I'll walk you through it. It's a, it shows a 50% probability. So, so given if you plant your cover crop September 15th in Iowa, um, I can show results from the entire Midwest. I assume most people would be from Iowa. So I um, trimmed it down, but we can talk about the rest of the Midwest easily. So in Iowa, if you plant your cover crop September 15th, if you terminate by, it looks like April, early April down in the Southern part of Iowa, then you have a 50% chance of having 4,500 pounds of cover crop biomass per acre on that date that you terminate. So I, I kind of picked, um, some dates from Sam's presentation. And so that's, that's where Sam is located. And in one of the trials he planted around September 15th, it looks like, it sounded like. Yep. Yeah, yeah. okay, so, yeah, September 11th. Um, 
And then he terminated May 18th, which actually looks pretty um, spot on um, for getting the, the 4,000 pounds per acre that he got. And in 2019, when he planted later, so he planted October 20th, so somewhere between these two, when he waited until June 7th to terminate, again, he got this, he got 6,000 pounds per acre. Um, and the one he terminated earlier, which was May 11th, I think, is that right, Sam? Mm -hmm. um, that one, like he said, he only got around 400 pounds. And so I think what Sam saw is consistent with what we're predicting, uh, which makes me feel Makes me feel good. Um, and so basically, the takeaway from this is that you're either going to have to plant a lot earlier than you're used to, probably before, before you're harvesting, or you're going to have to delay termination um, until after you're planting in order to get this 4,500 pounds per acre if you live in Iowa. And that, that um, like Sam said, there are some issues with insurance with the delayed planting, or sorry, the delayed termination after cash crop planting. So earlier planting might be the preferred route you go if you're really trying to, to increase your cover crop biomass. From mid-May till mid-June on our farm, we usually count on that biomass doubling every week if it's decent weather. Hey, there you go. So yeah, so just waiting a couple days even really get that, that growing. Dr. Andrea Bache, um, who's based out of Lincoln, I think she's working on doing some simulations to try to figure out if a day in the fall is worth more than a day in the spring. So basically, if you're trying to decide if you should really try to invest in trying to plant earlier in the fall versus later in the spring, um, she's finding that that a day in the fall is worth more than a day in the spring, but I know that's still um, kind of preliminary, and so that might change. But right now, that's what she's finding. So from our three metrics, we saw that cover crops definitely reduce weed biomass, um, and they have not, they don't really affect the weed density but we don't have any information on how they affect weed seed banks. So we don't, we don't know how long-term use of cover crops are going to affect sort of these longer term seed, seed bank dynamics. So we thought, well, who might have 10 years of rye cover crop strip trials that might have at least four replicates. And just to simplify the weed seed bank sampling, we also wanted to find places that are no-till. And thanks to PFI, the Practical Farmers of Iowa, and their fantastic network, and Sarah Carlson and Stephen Galens, we found three, we found farms in three different counties that met all of these criteria. So we worked with producers in Greene County, Boone County, and Washington County. And they were very kind and let me come out and take a bunch of soil from their strip trials. So what we did was we took these little PVC pipes that were 5.25 centimeters in diameter and we pounded them in and took down um, 10 centimeters because in no-till that's where most of your, your weeds are coming from is the seed bank in that top 10 centimeters. So we, we pulled that out and then punched the soil into a bucket. We took um, 25 25 of these cores per, per plot. So we dumped those into a bucket and then we got another bucket and did the same thing to the other plots. And once we had all of our plots collected, we dumped them into a greenhouse tray. Um, we put them over perlite and then we watered them. We watered them all summer long. And whenever a weed would come up, we would identify it and um, tally it and we would pull it there. I left some weeds in the trays just so I could get this picture. So this is one site and one of 
Um, let's see if you can see this. Yeah. So this is one treatment and this is the other treatment. And you can kind of visually see a difference. Um, not super striking, but there is a difference. So the, this is the soil that was pulled from the cover crop strips. And this is the soil that was pulled from the no cover strips. And again, this is just from one of the sites. And so once we added everything up, um, these are the results we got. So I've ordered these um, by site. So the green county had a, a grain rotation, um, a soybean corn rotation. In Boone, uh, they had both a corn silage and a um, corn grain rotation. And in the Washington County, they had a corn soybean grain rotation. So the black bars represent the number of weed seeds per square foot in the no cover treatment. And the green is the weed seed bank in the, the strips that received the rye cover crop treatment for the past 10 years. And actually the Boone location, they've had uh, their strips in place for over 15 now, I think. So these are, these are great long-term long -term studies. The, this red dotted line represents what you might expect in sort of an average Midwestern um, production field. And that was um, estimated based on a bunch of different samplings across the Midwest. So it's, it's across the Midwest and it's very rough, but I just wanted to provide it to give you sort of a, a benchmark to look at this. So I ordered the sites based on the size of the black bar. So as you move from left to right, the, the number of weed seeds in the, the control goes down. And something you'll also notice is that as you move from left to right, the effects of the cover crop on the weed seed bank it, um, goes from the largest effects down to no significant effect. So what this shows, what this means to me anyways, is that if you have a larger weed seed bank, cover crops have more of a potential to help you reduce that weed seed bank. Um, so another important question about this is what is the makeup of this weed seed bank? Like what, which, which of the weeds is being most affected by the cover crop? And we found that the reduction in the weed seed bank was largely due to reduction in water hemp seeds, germinable water, water hemp seeds. Um, lambs quarter, there was no difference. Purslane, actually, there was a small increase in the number of purslane seeds in the rye cover crop strips. Um, and then the other weeds were, were very small differences. So we looked at whether cover crops are increasing possibly the, the diversity of the weeds, the weed seed bank. And there is a trend towards an increase, but it, it, is, it isn't significant. Um, and I think that's just because weed data is just normally just, it's very messy. So it's really hard to find significant differences, but there is a trend. And the other question we had was how much cover crop biomass do you need to see these effects? Because in our, our previous analysis, we saw that you need 4,500 pounds per acre to get an effect, which is, which is a lot of biomass or a lot of cover crop biomass to try to get. But in this case, we took the average cover crop biomass production over the past 10 years for each site. So the green county site, Averaged over the last 10 years, they've gotten around 400 pounds per acre of cover crop biomass. The Boone silage site has gotten almost 2,000 pounds per acre, and that's compared to the Boone grain, which got about half of that. And that's due to the earlier cover crop planting that they're able to do because they take that corn off for silage. And then Washington, again, their average was around 1,200 pounds per acre. So, so this shows that even with fairly small 
cover crop biomass production, you can still get a really drastic and significant reduction in your weed seed bank. Just to summarize what I found um, in my research is that weed biomass is significantly reduced by grass cover crops. Um, it's not affected by non-grass cover crops, so that's something to keep in mind. But you do need a fair amount of um, cover crop production in order to see a really significant reduction. And weed density, there was no significant de decrease in response to cover cropping. But the weed seed bank showed that long-term cover cropping reduces the size of the weed seed bank. In particular, in the sites that we looked at, there was a big reduction in the number of water hemp seeds in the seed bank. And even low cover crop production, biomass-wise, seems to still have an, a positive effect on reducing the weed seed bank. And with that, I, of course, want to thank um, the farmers that let me onto their, onto their fields, so Jim Funky and Keith Kohler and Rob Stout. Um, thank you very much. And like I said, so science is not something you do by yourself. So I have to thank uh, my collaborators who are listed alphabetically, I want to note. Um, Andrea Bache and Lydia English, Matt Liebman, Rafa, uh, Rafael Martinez Feria, and David Weisberger. And of course, the wonderful PFI staff, Sarah Carlson and Stephen Galens. And I should thank Sarah, who provided um, money to help me do this study. So with that, I'm done. Great. Thanks, Gina. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. So now we have some time that we can open things up. And if anybody has any questions, they want to, um, you know, some clarifying questions or probe for, you know, if either of them have any further research they're thinking about, now's the time to do it. And to ask your questions, what you need to do is just hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen and a black toolbar will pop up and then hit the chat icon and that'll allow you to open that chat box and type in your questions so that we can see them in our end. Jean, I have a question for you. I don't know if you can pull your PowerPoint back up. Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah. Um, On the slide that had pictures of weeds growing in your trays. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do research like that. That's probably <laughs> one of a kind thing to water weed seeds all year. Yeah, yeah, that was. But I know on the ISU extension side of things, John Sawyer has done some research on even what leaving one water hemp plant go. Um, letting it grow, letting it produce seed, running it through a combine, spraying that seed, yeah. what it can do. Yeah. <laughs> it me a little bit. Um, so on the left side, cover crop, um, do you know how many of those weeds coming up, or you identified them, are any of those weeds coming up cover crop species that were hard seed or volunteer seed or anything of a intentional cover crop species? <laughs> That's really funny. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about this. That sure looks like a brassica of some sort. Yep. Or yep. Or something. Um, um, and it is. It's a, so this cooperator, I guess, was trying out cover crop mixes in another part of his farm. And so he said some of that seed must have gotten mixed in um, in this cover crop plot. And so, yeah, that's definitely um, a brassica cover crop seed that has been sitting there for who knows how long. <laughs> and, and yeah, you're spot on. One of my lab mates is, um, weed research is really tedious. That's something I'm learning. So she is collecting water hemp plants throughout the season and counting how many seeds they're producing. And I think one of, she found one plant that had produced a million seeds. Mm -hmm. wow. 
So yeah, one one plant can definitely, especially water hemp with their tiny little seeds, can really can really spill a lot of seeds into your soil quickly. And then um, the organic side of me is asking lack of grass species as weeds in your trays. Um, did you count much for grass species or it didn't didn't add up to a whole lot or? Yeah, it didn't. So I think everything else was just really trumped by the water hemp um, numbers. There were there were a fair number. There was some foxtail um, and hairy crabgrass and what else? I think there was some downy brome, but um, they were kind of few and far between compared to the the water hemp, the other broadleafs. And that could have been um, a function of the way we were watering. So I, I still wonder this. This um, It's not a terribly natural way for weeds to grow. <laughs> uh, we really babied them. They were in a greenhouse. Uh, so we sampled in April. So we assumed that most of the seeds would have gone through the, the winter stratification. So they would have gotten the cold treatment. Um, but this greenhouse was really nice and warm and we kept everything really moist and there wasn't a lot of stress. So, so just the process that we used might have selected for a particular type of weed and selected against something like grasses. I wondered about that. Um, I'm not sure. What other ways could you have counted the seeds though? Would so, it be possible to physically? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, another, another sort of downside of using this method is we're only getting live weed seeds or germinable weed seeds. So something Matt Liebman does um, is he takes soil samples and then he washes all of the soil out of it and then keeps all of the organic matter and has someone go through with a microscope and identify all of the weed seeds, and then they do a test to see if those seeds are alive or not. And so he gets a total number of weed seeds, and then he gets a percent that are viable. Right. Um, but that, he, he does that, that takes a long, long, long time. And you'd be limited in the amount of samples and sites you could really do. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so he does that just for one site, and I think it takes him, he's doing that for six, he has two or three people working on that full time for about six months. Wow. So if you're really interested in, in sort of looking at like the, uh, the viability of weed seeds, that's, that's a really good way to do it. But for a quick and dirty sort of study, this is, this is widely used. So it, it, did, it makes me feel a little better that it is definitely valid, but it gives you different information than the seed counting method would. In my trials, weed counts have been time consuming, obviously. Um, what we did for weed counting, we made a transect, um, picked basically random numbers that added up to 100, and walked in the strips and I started out by thinking about counting the number of weeds that were within a foot or so of my boot tip wherever I stopped. Mm. And even in those weediest strips, I wasn't coming up with any. I'd walk a whole strip that I was surrounded in weeds and I would never have a weed close to my boot. So definitely weed density wasn't there, but the big weeds that had come through were still there. <laughs> so we modified that to I would walk out in a field and I'd hold my arms straight out spread eagle and make a circle and any <laughs> any uh weeds under the, my wing tips I would count those well my favorite neighbor that visits the coffee shop too often saw me out there walking away and then twirling <laughs> a little pirouette and <laughs> the next day at lunch Everybody wondered what the heck I was up to, <laughs> but just enjoy um, life. <laughs> yep. So, with that, I guess in cover crop research and whatever you do on your farm, and we're gonna start measuring some of this in PFI 
cooperators program trials is we might answer some questions we might ask more questions but at the end of the day what brings you joy on your farm and in your research <laughs> and really i mean maybe the results don't matter that much but if you're happy doing it why not try something or try a cover crop for the first time or look at the way some of these things can benefit you but yeah the, we brought that up at our croppers meeting this year and it resonated with a lot of people that maybe we're not achieving everything we want to achieve with this stuff but if it makes you happy why not absolutely i think that's great yeah <laughs> um oh do we have any questions from the attendees that are still hanging out if so just open your chat box and plug your question in yeah you're welcome, Carl and Angel, <laughs> for listening. So some of my, or well, all of my research has been pretty much on conventional farms where I still have the big hammer in my toolbox of herbicide for weed control. Um, a lot of the research and a lot of the things that you might look at, looking at cover crops for weed control is all on the organic side and using cover crop based no-till organic systems and there's some real promise in some of that. I, I think most everybody agrees there's still some kinks to work out and there's still the potential for catastrophic failure um, <laughs> in about anything but I think and I'm hoping even some of the research and um, results that I'm getting from my trials might help in some of those systems where I might be able to push the envelope a little bit because I still have that option to rescue things but yeah here's a question uh sam what are other bonus benefits you've observed with using cover crops um so we've been long-term no-till for a long time um we used no-till quite a while back to reduce labor to reduce erosion obviously we sit in some kind of rolling hills nothing crazy but we do have a fair amount of terraces and we had some farms that probably needed more terraces and we learned that by using no-till we could reduce some of that downhill movement of soil um, but one of the side effects one of the downsides of no-till for us is we had compaction that was hard to fix. Um, I wouldn't agree that deep tillage fixes compaction, but it can alleviate things temporarily. Um, and cover crops for us sent roots really deep into the soil, increased our organic matter, but made root channels deep through that compaction layer that increased our water infiltration to the point where when we get those ridiculous rains in the spring and summer where the whole field just looks like a sheen of water. Um, we can pull up to a fence between a neighbor's field and ours and the neighbor's field just looks like a skating rink or a pond that's just completely saturated and his water on his farm moves horizontally and ours moves down. It moves vertically. It goes straight in the soil. So we've built that soil structure. We've increased water infiltration. We've got those old root channels and earthworm channels that aren't being disturbed. And the water goes straight down to the point where like in 2012, when we had a nasty drought, some of the neighbors had 50, 60, 70 bushel corn yields. And we had over 200 bushel corn yields. Um, wow. I wouldn't say that was necessarily because of a cover crop that year because we don't do a ton of cover crops before corn. Um, and if we do, they're usually winter kill type cover crops, um, like fall planted oats. Um, but we built that soil structure, built that soil health to the point that we effectively weatherproofed our farm um, and produced some pretty, pretty good yields in adverse conditions. Um, also, some benefits that I see that maybe don't always pay the bills, but when I walk out in a cover crop field before I'm planting beans or after I'm planting beans or even if, after I've sprayed a cover crop and it's dead and looks like straw out there, the diversity of 
wildlife, birds, insects, butterflies, all these things, even in just a, a monoculture of a rye cover crop. I mean, you go out in a tilled field and there's not much going on. Walk out in a rye field or a cover crop field that you got headed out rye up to your armpits and stop and listen for a little while and there's way more birds way more insects just a lot of things going on and then on the way back to the truck jump a fawn out of the cover crop that you couldn't see from the road or something like that just all of those things are added benefits and bonuses for me I guess. How long did it take before you saw the benefits in your soil structure with the cover crops? Uh, for us, it's been difficult to really narrow that down because I think we saw some of those benefits just from long-term no-till. Mm -hmm. But I think we saw that, I mean, that tale of two fields where we had one field with cover crops and one field without, and that weed control difference between the two with similar herbicide programs, that was on year one. Mm -hmm. So the very first time we tried a rye cover crop, we saw that that difference. And we tried, we tried annual ryegrass and some other things and um, oats and radishes and things before we really got onto cereal rye and everybody else got onto cereal rye. Um, and we didn't see those benefits then, but as soon as we started with cereal rye, it greens up faster in the spring, whatever other reasons, we saw those benefits from year one. Um, I think on some of our farms that have had continuous cover crops, at least before beans, I, those those benefits are compounding. Um, probably the, the second cycle of cover crops definitely was like the eye opener that we saw real benefits. Great, thanks. And then Gina, are you doing any more, like any follow up with any of the um, the collection that you've done with those three sites or with further, I don't know, looking into the literature to answer some additional questions or anything? Um, that's a good question. I'm working right now on writing up the results from these two studies. And so that's consuming most of my brain power. Um, I hadn't really thought about what's next um something sam you said it, it's not <laughs> it's not an agronomist question but there are researchers who are looking at um soundscapes and seeing how different landscapes sound as a measure of ecosystem health and i don't think people have really looked at agriculture landscapes listening to them to seeing seeing um how different managements might affect the way they sound. But just based on your observations, I think that would be a really neat experiment is just to, to listen to your, your cover crops fields in the spring versus a, a tilled field without cover crops. We've had somebody approach me about that and we haven't done it yet, but it's yeah? um, PFI is putting some more focus on um, habitat and things like that. Um, so that probably will be something to do in the future. Oh, cool. But we yeah. talked about obviously in the early spring, a green field versus a tilled black field. And later in the spring, a really green field compared to a freshly planted field. And then later on a field that looks like a mature grass versus a freshly planted field. I mean, those are all, if a, if a bird or an insect or something had to choose between landing in a tilled black field and a, a field that's covered with cover crops, that yeah. I think that'd be a pretty good, a no pretty good option for whatever yeah. species that is. So it's concentration of different wildlife. Yeah, that's really neat. And we've seen some pretty neat birds come back or see more of them or have the opportunity to see them that we hadn't seen in a long time, like dick sissels and bobolinks and oh, wow. other species that we normally wouldn't see, but especially just spending more time in the fields doing some of these um, collection, data collection for these trials, we spend more time out there and mm. just stop and look around and you get to enjoy some of those things.
Yeah, I agree. I think the funnest part of this was just being in the field for so long and getting to hear these things that you wouldn't normally notice, I think. So, yeah. Well, I last call for any questions. Um, if you do end up having a question for either of our speakers after the fact, um, I can provide some contact information um, later or I I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to take emails from anyone that might have any additional questions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm.